question, hotshot. Do you work to live or live to work? Now, maybe you haven't thought about it that much because you don't really have a choice. For many of us, our job is essential to our identity whether we like it or not. And that's been true since people started getting the last name Smith because they were the village blacksmith. I assume I have my last name because one of my ancestors was the village arsonist. And they were like, oh, we'll call him Burns because he's constantly burning things down because that's the only thing that gets him off. But lately, things feel more extreme. Today, you don't just have to accept that your life and identity is irreparably tied to some company that you can't afford stock in. You're also expected to find meaning, health, friendship, and joy in your professional community. You're no longer a worker with a boss and coworkers. You're a partner with your team working on a shared vision. And while it might seem enticing to have a job with kombucha on tap, uh, weekly yoga classes, and a beanbag room, there may be something way more sinister going on. We'll explain in this Wisecrack edition on workplace culture, when did it get so creepy? So how did attending the company field trip to SeaWorld come to feel as vital to job security as, you know, actually doing your job? It's complicated. The concept of corporate culture was developed by Canadian social scientist Elliot Jacques while studying 1950s factory workers. But it didn't become popular until the 80s when America faced increased competition from Japan, which experts attributed in part to Japanese companies' superior corporate culture. Bosses and managers began thinking about how they could make workers happy and thus increase output via things like in-office gyms or mentorship programs. Strategies evolved over the years, but as Silicon Valley disrupted the economy, it also disrupted the very concept of corporate culture through its emphasis on fun, youth, and endless perks at offices, which were now dubbed campuses. Writer Dan Lyons, who worked in tech in the mid-2000s before writing for the show Silicon Valley, describes a world of mandatory Lego play, open offices, and the recasting of firing as graduation. Now, the push to make offices more playful escalated, and the career of Fun Sultant emerged to program workplace fun, inspired by things like Google Slides and Facebook's extracurricular woodworking classes. To be clear, I'm not making any of this up. These are all real things. If you've had to do stuff like this at your job, please let us know in the comments because we want to know more about this stuff. Shoe retailer Zappos asked employees to dress as their favorite animal, while IDEO hosts hero events, which include personal storytelling events for employees. Oh God. And while having more pizza parties or uh, storytelling events with your coworkers might sound annoying, it's not especially evil, right? Well, it might be, according to journalist Radhika Panjwani. Specifically, the mandatory or implied requirement of these events make employees who don't want to spend their free time with their coworkers feel like they're not team players. Even when presented as optional, there's still pressure from bosses or even just the internalized sense that missing out on trust falls with Gareth from accounting means losing the opportunity to curry favor at work. Stories have even cropped up of workers being uh, graduated for not embracing their company's culture of fun, demonstrating the very real retaliatory risk of not throwing down during optional tiki happy hour. And remember, next Friday is Hawaiian shirt day. It's also worth noting what companies aren't doing when they build a culture around fun. As journalist Lauren Collins writes, work fun is fine but it is a poor substitute for the attributes that make a workplace truly attractive. Job stability, proper benefits, equal pay, prospects for advancement, flexibility, a respectful and well-resourced environment. Nobody wants a field trip at the expense of a generous vacation allowance. In other words, even if you do enjoy taking the occasional at-work woodworking class, chances are you'd be happier with a bigger paycheck. And yet, mandatory fun in the workplace continues, and workers feel pressured to participate lest they look disagreeable or uncommitted. And nobody seems happy about it. Ultimately, the dissatisfaction with mandatory workplace fun stems from a fundamental disconnect between our desire to be good workers and our desire to do what we want with our time. And we can better understand this via the work of French philosopher and bald king, Michel Foucault, whose concept of biopower can illuminate why work started feeling like adult daycare. Biopower, very simply put, is about regulating human bodies through social norms based on specific identity-based or social categories like race, gender, class, and so on. Through the taxonomization of these identities, power is subtly working to limit and regulate the possibilities of who we can be. For example, people who have served time in prison are categorized as ex-cons 
and thus become markedly less employable. Now, the power important to Foucault is not the overt force we might associate with cops or the military, but rather that tacit, subtle micropower which causes people to behave and understand themselves within very limited possibilities. For example, we may think we're free because we can uh, buy a Nerf gun on sale at Target, but we're not thinking about how the advertising industry convinced us that Nerf guns were cool in the first place. But seriously though, Nerf guns are actually kind of cool and I don't feel bad because this one was just in our office so we didn't have to go to Target to get it, so it still feels pretty cool. We're gonna go outside later because the TikTok building is across the way. So we're gonna try to shoot, shoot it at some TikTok executives. The goal of power is therefore an effort to make people active in their own self-governance within the delineated possibilities of identity. For example, if working class folks are taught to see themselves as inherently powerless, well, they're not gonna feel empowered to agitate for change. Social order, maintained. As scholar Kaspar Valadsen explains, modern power then should not act directly upon people to force and control. It should rather shape and influence the ways in which people act upon themselves. If you ever wanted to ask for a raise or promotion but thought to yourself, now isn't a good time as, as the team is going through a big transition and, and I don't want to rock the boat, you might know what this feels like. This has all kinds of effects on our self-conception. For example, if you categorize yourself as an extrovert rather than just a human who needs social interaction to survive, you internalize that quality. And this isn't inherently negative, but it ensures the next time you're at a loss for words at a party, you'll feel you fail to live up to your true identity and maybe even make you judge your own self-worth. Or at the very least, prepare five jokes to deploy next time you experience a long, awkward pause. In the modern workplace then, we all wanna take on the identity of good worker, especially in times of economic instability, i.e. my entire past, present, and future working life. Unfortunately though, the conception of a good worker is constantly in flux, and today's version feels uniquely demanding. As Valadsen writes, popular buzzwords that have emerged recently include involvement, participation, personal fulfillment, employee ownership of values, delegation of competence, innovation from below, and more. They articulate the same fundamental principle. The employee should not be told what to do, but should be stimulated so as to take initiatives by his own initiative. This conception of a good worker makes sense in the context of biopower, given the emphasis on self-regulation. The ideal worker today is almost entirely self-governed, having internalized their boss's aims and goals. It's like if you've ever worked on the weekend just to make sure you were all caught up, even after working a 40 hour plus week, you too might be biopowered. So how do our companies make us the John Malkovich to our bosses, John Cusack? To explain how biopower physically plays out, Foucault invokes the notion of the panopticon as the operating schema of disciplinary power. The panopticon, of course, is the style of prison designed such that the prisoner is always under threat of observation. The term's meaning has expanded to describe other settings where the threat of perpetual observation exists. Open plan offices come to mind in this context. Though they're presented as team motivated, the uh, chill younger sibling of cubicles, they actually have a panopticon style effect of ensuring that you're always at risk of your boss looking over your shoulder. Through the possibility of always being watched, whether your prison guard or boss is actually paying attention, one begins to act as they ought, according to their delineated identity. This often means going above and beyond your job description, a practice so common that its alternative, which is just like doing your job as normal, is now called quiet quitting. And when biopower is efficient, it means that even when you're working from home, you've internalized an anxiety about not looking like you're slacking off. And when we fully internalize our work identity, scholar Peter Fleming writes, jobs are no longer defined as something we do among other things, but what we are. Suddenly, way more than 40 hours of our weeks are up for grabs, including extracurricular workplace fun, which we indulge in for the sake of culture. After all, we all wanna be good workers. But Michael, you may be wondering, what about all the positive aspects of workplace culture? The helpful things like uh, free snacks or mindfulness classes? Well, we'd argue that the pervasiveness of biopower is just as present in helpful things like mindfulness. Now, we've done a video on this, but just as a reminder, mindfulness is a great practice that has also become hugely commercialized and commodified. And increasingly, it's being used by managers and HR to treat disengaged employees, who as a group cost the US economy an estimated $550 billion annually. 
Well-being interventions like mindfulness classes teach workers to self-regulate when work gets too stressful and thus function as an extension of biopower via self-governance. Rather than acknowledging that their workplace conditions are increasingly untenable, mindfulness suggests people turn inwards to self-regulate and govern their internal emotions and thoughts. In this way, as sociologist Carolyn Chen puts it, companies have taken up pastoral and spiritual care as a way to make their employees more productive. As such, the structure of the workplace, even at its most helpful, functionally demands that employees become workers who are sometimes people, rather than people who also work. Mindfulness is a salient example of what scholar Christian Maravellius describes as a post-bureaucratic tendency in which employers seek to exploit aspects of individuals' personal spheres which may be valuable in work. Your ability to regulate your thoughts is deeply personal, but increasingly valuable to your employer. Now, this is hardly exclusive to mindfulness. Fleming argues that in general, the erosion of the line between work and non-work via things like flexible hours or remote work, far from freeing us, actually doubly imprisons us. He cites a study by Andrew Ross from 2004, which showed that managers fully understood that workers were likely to have ideas off the clock. Thus, they allowed for more remote or flexible work, not to be generous, but because the goal was to extract every waking moment of an employee's day. Indeed, studies show that remote workers typically work more hours. The increased blurriness between work and non-work allows employers to squeeze more work value out of us. That brilliant idea you had on vacation? Well, it still contributes to your company's bottom line, after all. And of course, it doesn't hurt that there's apps like Slack, which basically mimic the feelings we get on our social media apps, and then encourage us to check in on our own time the same way we do on things like TikTok and Twitter. Now, Fleming argues that the recent erosion of boundaries between work and non-work directly tapped into labor productivity, especially when workers began to think of their jobs as something more than just work. This takes us back to Silicon Valley, where Chen argues over the course of the tech industry's ascent, work has increasingly replaced religion. She writes that workers today are looking to the workplace to slake, i.e. quench, their thirst for belonging, identity, purpose, and transcendence. More and more companies have become America's new temples, churches, mosques, and synagogues. Work has become a spiritual practice that inspires religious fervor. People are not selling their souls at work. Rather, work is where they find their souls. Hey, this is why no matter what, I encourage all of you to be workplace atheists. Let's do it. Let's start a movement. Someone make a t-shirt that says workplace atheist. Send it to us and I'll, I'll wear it on it on the show. I'll wear it on this if you send it in. And if their soul has to be found at the foosball table, management is all too happy to oblige. When something's your religion, it bleeds into every area of your life, which is frankly also great for your company's bottom line. And guys, I'll say it's as I'm saying this it's weird to think about because I'm someone who before I had this job is all I've always loved philosophy and pop culture and movies and TV and the internet, but now all the things that I just like play into this job. So there's times where if I want to read or think about stuff off work, I feel like I'm doing my job and that sucks. So I'm just being honest with you, you know, just honesty corner over here. You can be honest in the comments too. Let's be honest with each other. Fleming cites multiple studies showing the way managers increasingly understand that their workers' extracurricular activities, say gaming programmers playing games on their off time, make them better at their jobs. This is a systemic result of deindustrialization. Whereas Fleming writes, many jobs come to include an immaterial or highly socialized element, partially detached from concrete tasks. Work becomes framed in terms of human capital that emphasizes life skills, communicative abilities, self-organizing capabilities, and emotional intelligence. It's in your company's best interest for you to apply, say, the uh, problem-solving skills you learned in couples therapy to settling a dispute between your two underlings. Fleming notes the way airline attendants are told to act as if the cabin is in your living room as a means of eliciting a kind of on-the-clock emotional labor that really only makes sense in non-work settings. In this way, the emotional labor of attending happy hour becomes emblematic of what's really being asked of you at work, the total subsumption of your identity. In his Birth of Biopolitics lectures, Foucault noted how 1970s economists were proposing ideas about human capital that applied economic utility and governance to the individual's life itself, making them into a sort of permanent and multiple enterprise. This makes me think of how we all consider ourselves brands now, which sucks. He argues that when we apply economic models of supply and demand, cost and profit in this way, it becomes a model of social relations and existence itself, a form of relationship of the individual to himself, time, 
those around him, the group, and the family. That is to say, when we become mere workers, we start to treat our entire lives like jobs. The micro-functionings of power today ensure that being a good worker is core to our identity. And that pressures us to participate in workplace fun even when we don't want to. Even helpful things like mindfulness practices contribute to the internalization of our identity as worker, both inside the office and out. And biopower's extension into the workplace seems to have no end in sight. And sadly, we don't have a magical solution to this large-scale, multifaceted problem. But maybe we can all at least be a little more mindful of what's really going on when our bosses remind us that our coworkers are our teammates and, and that we're all in one big team changing the world through our shared hustle. But what do you guys think? Are cheerful HR reps the new prison guards? Aren't we all becoming perfect little workplace subjects? Or is it actually pretty dank to have kombucha on tap and catered lunches at your startup job? Please let us know what you think in the comments. Special shout out to all of our patrons. Thank you so much for supporting us. Um, it really helps us when you all support us directly. It makes us less dependent on advertisers and the fluctuations of economic forces. And also you get extra content and videos without ads and you get to jump on our Discord server so everyone wins. Um, but thanks to the rest of you as well for being here, for watching our videos, for liking, subscribing, for commenting, all those things. It means a lot to us. And special thanks to everyone who watched this video at their job, stealing time from the man to learn stuff about why the man is bad. We really appreciate that. Until next time, we'll see you later.